Hello, I am Fiona Sitkin, a host of The Bridge for Women Worldwide, a talk show. Today I'm hosting the third talk show. Welcome to the show, Maya. Hello. Hello, Fiona. Thank you very much for inviting me. It means a lot. It's an honor to be regarded as someone who you believe that can share its little bits of, of uh, insights and, as you say, um, experiences to you and your audience. So thank you for having me. And I would like to tell you also, um, it's great that what you are doing, um, the awareness of immigrant women and our battle and putting uh, stories that will inspire all those women that are in the country, doesn't matter if they are born in America or they immigrated to America. We learn from our own skin, but we also learn from other people's skin. So thank you thank very you. much. And thank you. Yeah, it's an honor for me uh, that you are giving me the interview. Well, um, Maya Estrella Migotti came to the United States 12 years ago as a career expatriate um, for Ericsson Silicon Valley. And um, when she was appointed a VP and head of Ericsson Silicon Valley, she knew better than to be a domineering boss. Why? Because her previous assignments in Australia, in Spain, in Sweden, well prepared her for this important executive position. Maya proved to be a never give up professional and also an outstanding feminist promoting women engineers. Uh, she is culturally sensitive, a truly inclusive leader, the kind that our country needs desperately at this time. So welcome to the show, Maya. Thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, my first question to you would be, with your glorious career in technology, many people would love to know how it all started when you were growing up in Zagreb, Croatia, former Yugoslavia. What was the promise of technology for you? Why? So, um, you know, if there was anything good in the former communist Yugoslavia, then it was schools. Schools were very good and those that were studying hard and have a good achievements really could make a career um, and choose to study whatever they qualified for. So that was really great. Um, as a high school student, I was an astronomer and it was not really possible to study astronomy in Yugoslavia and then my so astronomical society said if you finish mathematic physics or electrotechnical university we will send you a postgrad studies of astronomy in usa i said oh wow. great and this is how i entered uh, electrotechnical university of zagreb and start studying electrical engineering uh, at the end instead of going to postgrad to us i married and got a kid so ah. everything I, at the end I still did finish in US, but many ah, years left. I see, I see, so that was the start, nice. Um, you traveled all over the world and worked in many countries. What was the global mindset for you? How important it was in your work? It was extremely important and uh, I had that advantage to enter Ericsson which is a big, big global company and put a lot of uh, emphasis on the different cultures. And when you are sent to a country, you have a team of people that work with you, you go on, you have a cultural training, how to behave in the different societies and so on. Um, when I started at Ericsson 87, the world was not that global as it is today, ah. because today through internet and globalization and, and right. we, we live in, yes. we never live in so unified world with more understanding and, you know, the music and the culture, the movies, everything. It was not really like that in 87. So yes. I had a start coming from a company that was global and put a lot of emphasis on different cu culture and we, you know, we got all the support that we needed. 
and uh, uh, you know the countries it's not the countries that I lived and worked it's also the countries where I had customers when I had to travel deal with customers uh -huh. or design centers around the world which I had and it's really different uh, running um, your design office in Brazil or in Shanghai huge uh -huh. difference or Bangalore and you uh -huh. have to take consideration how people think how people feel what is culturally and socially okay to say and to do and what is not uh-huh well so yeah you had great experiences and you know Maya you are known for promoting innovation and creativity big time when an Ericsson and beyond could you say a few words about it what were the ways well, it's, it's another, I think that uh, when you choose um, engineering, um, it's also very much like, a, for many people, it's very much like a calling. So you like that every year you have to learn something new and you have to innovate in order to stay competitive. Um, we have seen in, technolo in technology companies that flourish fabulous, great, and then disappear within the seven years. Right. So then of your initial product is very short because you have to permanently uh, develop, uh, look at the market, innovate and so uh -huh. on. And especially, so Ericsson is 143 years old company and if it was not innovative, it would be gone long time ago. So I had, again, advantage to be in a company that put a lot of effort in innovation. Furthermore, when I came to become a head of Ericsson in Silicon Valley, I was wondering, now I'm in cradle of innovation of all world technology. How can I make my design centers around the world more innovative? What do I have to do? And I work with um, a company idea in Silicon Valley and established the process for, for innovation, which was adopted across the uh, different design centers. And, and I also believe that um, in order to prevail today, uh, you have to all the time innovate, not only in your adjacent markets, you have to innovate also in, in disruptive areas, like, for example, Apple. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's a good example. Yes. Um, Maya, I called you an executive feminist in my book uh, because you were promoting women engineers and even created women in leadership group. Now, how exactly does it work or did it work? Um, it's, this is a tough one. Uh, first of all, um, you have to have a willing subject. Ah. Many times I have approached women to take next step in career, but they have been already so disappointed and beaten up with the environment and you know if you over the years put someone down and don't let go forward it's very hard that suddenly you are 42 and you say oh really i want to be a leader so um the if you you know in order to promote that uh, whatever in every place where i was i always worked through the managers uh -huh. and and you can't just have a group of women that want to empower themselves and so on you have to involve all managerial structure to put an effort and education uh, for for women and it's very good that this becomes organized like i was doing that through women in leadership organization but i had been also very active in uh, silicon valley in for example in watermark and also in uh -huh. g yes. organization so, so um Am I executive feminist? Uh, I would more say I'm executive with equal opportunity okay. for all the gender, all the culture, because what I'm driven with is a competence and creating diverse team as they produce much better results than you I agree. Right, right, right. Still, talking about women, is the situation for women in technology changing for the better today or is it changing for the worse because of the pandemic and unemployment or is it stuck and on the same level that's a big question 
It is a big question and very complicated because when you talk about this pandemic and the world, how it's changing, I think the changes that are happening socially and business-wise are huge. And we cannot grasp them now. We will need some time to see how much our way of living and working has changed and what this means for the for the women employees. I think that um, the opportunity for, for example, if you look women in technology or a woman in STEM, um, right. now we're much more working from home and so on, and you are judged on the different ways and you have much more focus on deliveries. I believe it should not jeopardize uh, you know, a gender. Um, I don't believe that uh, inequalities are going to be bigger uh, uh -huh. in the world we are. But I am very concerned about uh, impact on family, impact on you know, gender suffering. Uh, on the different ways, uh, we have seen that there's a lot of domestic violence. Right. And who are most vulnerable are children and women all right. over the world. So that is my much bigger concern. When we talk about the technology, um, you know, every, everything comes in waves. So when uh. I entered technology, there were not that many women entering engineering. In 80s, a lot of women entered engineering. For example, I know that in US, like 30% of all engineering students were women. But uh. then it dropped to, you know, in recent years, maybe to 11%. So what wow. it actually creates, it creates the, the pool of the, of the newcomers to the company is not genderly balanced, which means you have far less uh, women entering this type of the profession. All the software engineering is a little bit more because um, right. uh, the statistic is showing that uh, software engineering uh, has higher percentage of uh, female students. So this is good because in order to create a um, balanced environment and have enough big pool to select your leaders and that, that makes the difference. It's very hard if you have only 11% of the female employees. Like right. some companies like that. And many companies are putting the programs like Ericsson do the program, Intel put that program. I know that Google and Facebook, everybody's work very hard on getting diversity and gender diversity. And some, um, many of these companies are also investing in STEM education because you have to start in, in a primary school. You have to start with K1 to K8 and then to K12 right. in attracting more, um, more girls to the STEM subject. So you can put like a lot of money in, into uh -huh. uh, into these programs. So let us see how, how the future looks like. Um, definitely US is behind Europe in uh -huh. the amount of women uh, studying and uh, entering um, this the profession. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, yes. So you put an emphasis on education. I understand this as a professional educator. Everything comes to the root, to education. Exactly. It is my understanding, Maya, that you are now at, at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence technology in your role of CEO of for PIA Inc. Could you tell us more about it? So um, the, this is one of the companies that I did invest and my very good friend started the company. It's, this is in... Uh, political domain, we, our current niche is a political domain. So what uh -huh. we are looking, uh, we are doing a lot of social listening and trying to figure out what is the, the feeling of the people, who is going to win. Um, the company in 2016 predicted that Trump is going to win and no one believed my friend, you know, Rani Yada, uh -huh. Ranjan, that's the company, that this is really going to happen we all love because the calls for Hillary were so high uh -huh. and, and this is this is very interesting you know the, the the AI actually is a number of very very sophisticated algorithms that are looking which words are people using when answering on tweets uh -huh. and based on which words and so on you have this sentiment 
sentiment analysis, which tells you what really that person thinks and yes. people to vote up and down and so on. So um, the AI is the one that actually um, brings um, this, uh, and tell you, you know, this AI analysis, who, yes. who is currently yeah. high, high in the people, you know, whom people will vote. Because uh -huh. many times you don't want to really say for whom you are going to vote. No. Um, because in your area, maybe, you know, in your friends and so on, you will be very unpopular. And, uh, right. but the way how you respond, uh, your, when your social, you know, what you put out uh -huh. and comment and what you like and dislike when it's coming is actually telling, it's telling, you know, um, a lot who, who has a higher chances to. Yeah. Uh-huh. So and don't ask who's going to win. Um, no, no, I'm not asking. I'm afraid to, to hear the answer, maybe. <laughs> So this software and this company is analyzing the speech flow and thinking about the guts of the person, what that person thinks by the way they're expressing their ideas, right? So, so the company actually, first we have a list of all the um, 536 congressmen and the president, uh -huh. the president's page, and then we pull out all the tweets that they um, our top representatives are tweeting and then uh -huh. you can stop the words and you can see what do democrats what do republicans uh, you can see all the tweets on one place uh, you can also see how many likes dislikes they have got from our um, our users uh -huh. and also uh, you know when you tweet something people answer your tweets right. and then you can yeah then you can see yes. what do we they use and then you can get this so so it's a it's 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 sort of like a platform that simplifies for uh -huh. ordinary, ordinary user doesn't have time to watch a lot of tv which is very very uh, the tv that we have today um, yes. there is a lot of biasness wherever uh -huh. you're watching so so um we made that platform for the people that actually want to have a very brief uh, understanding what yes. is happening today and what our top guys have tweeted, what they have tweeted, not what someone commented or said or uh -huh. fake news and so on. Everything comes from, from 536 plus photos. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a lot of respect for artificial intelligence. My husband is an artificial intelligence, so I have a many, many idea of what it is and, and respect it. Well, and thank you so very much for explaining it in more detail. Maya, yours is an amazing American success story with many lessons for me and for our listeners as well. A round of applause for Maya. <laughs> um, and now for my personal opinion on this. I would like to say that Maya exemplifies all seven success values from my book. And this is in part two. Maya is really number one in character building and inclusive leadership and strategic thinking. So reading the book and the second chapter of it, the second part of it, you can read more about it and about Maya. Now, let us summarize our interview, Becoming an Inclusive Leader in the United States. I believe we can have three takeaways from the interview. One, it is possible for a woman of foreign descent to become a corporate leader in America. Two, strong women like Maya Strala Migotti are uh, very outstanding role models, very worthy role models for inclusive leadership. And three, order the book, How They Made It in America, to learn how to become a leader in the United States. 